Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Anyone who's been involved in very many weddings knows that there's always something that doesn't go according to plan. It might be something humorous, like when my sister-in-law got the giggles during her vows. Or something not so humorous, like the groom who was so jet-lagged that he passed out three times during the ceremony. And the fourth time that he felt ill, he didn't pass out again, but instead he threw up on the bride. Okay, that's hot funny now, but it probably wasn't at the time. In our gospel reading this morning, we hear about one of these wedding mishaps. In the midst of what was probably a multi-day and perhaps even week-long feast, the wine has run out. This would not have just been embarrassing for the family hosting the celebration, but given that the first century culture at the time was an honor-shame society, the family would have been viewed as at least negligent in their planning, if not downright miserly for having not provided enough libation to properly celebrate and honor their guests. According to John's Gospel, this is the first miracle that Jesus performs. As such, it sets the stage for Jesus' entire ministry, and there are many elements of that ministry that are already evident in this first miracle, elements that still carry meaning for us in our lives today. First, there's the venue of the miracle, a wedding. Jesus is close enough to this family and community to have been invited in the first place, and by his attendance, we see that he is willing to participate in the life of the community. And he's not just at the ceremony, but at the celebration feast that follows as well. Jesus obviously appreciates and participates in the joyous occasions of life. To the extent we model our lives on Jesus' life, then we too should participate fully in our community and in such joyous events. Then there's how Jesus heard about the problem at the wedding. It was his mother who came to him with the news. As would happen over and over again in Jesus' ministry, people come to him with their problems or the problems of others. Jesus did not have to go looking for those in need. People just had faith that he could help them or their friends or relatives. His mother was but the first in a long line of people to exhibit that faith. We continue that line of faithful people when we bring our cares and concerns to God in prayer, both concerns for ourselves and concerns for others. Then there's what Jesus uses to accomplish this first miracle. Simple, everyday things such as water and stone jars. His later healings will use mud, spit, bread, and fish. Jesus also uses other people who help with this miracle. There are the servants who had to carry all those gallons of water to fill the jars. It isn't much different today. There are many people involved in the miracles that take place in our lives, so much so that we may forget that it is indeed a miracle that has occurred. The miracles of modern medicine come especially to mind. Though these are brought to us by human hands, their miraculous nature is no less present. Finally, there's how few people, and especially which people, knew about this miracle. It wasn't the bride and groom, it wasn't the hosts, it wasn't even the wine steward, but the lowly servants alone, along with the disciples and Jesus' mother, who knew about the miracle. This will certainly not be the last time Jesus works his miracles among the common people or even the outcasts of society. Nor will this be the only time that Jesus tries to keep the news of his miracles limited to only those immediately affected. Now in walking through this miracle story, I skipped one of the key steps. I saved it for last because I think it's the most important part of the story. After Jesus' mother tells him about the lack of wine, she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. This is probably the most important lesson we can take from this story. Do whatever he tells you. Like Jesus' mother, I can't presume to know what that might be. For each of you, it will be different. 
What I can tell you is that he is asking you to do things. And as stated in our second lesson, he has given you the necessary gifts to accomplish whatever that might be. Each of us has different gifts, and we are each placed in different settings in which to use these gifts. Now, it may not always be clear what the end result of our task is supposed to be. It reminds me of a story of a man who was told by God to push against a very large boulder. So he spent every day, all day, pushing against the boulder. But the ne boulder never moved even an inch. After years of this, he became discouraged and he complained to God about the impossible task he'd been given. God told him that the instruction was not to move the boulder, 